Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Ann. <laughs> this is session 23. We'd like to welcome you today. My name's Anna Archilla, and I have Cynthia Hammond and Ingrid Valentine alongside of me today. Today we're going to talk about the act, the Cleary Act, hate crimes, sexual violence, and emergency management. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Strategies for success. An institution needs to plan for success. And what does that mean? That means you need to be proactive. You need to form strong partnerships with your local law enforcement and or community leaders. You need to encourage prompt reporting, foster culture of transparency, resolve complaints on a timely manner, and make it easy for everyone to follow. The basics of the Cleary Act. <clears throat> We talk a lot about the basics because, believe it or not, institutions are still falling short in this area. Whether you're an institution of 50 students or 50,000 students, you still have to be compliant in every aspect of the Cleary Act, which includes the annual security report, which is the production, distribution, and notification. And we'll get into that a little later. Annual crime statistics survey. Who at your institution fills that out and do you turn it into the department on time? You have two types of safety alerts. You have timely warning and you have emergency notification. Do you have a plan in place in the event that you need to evacuate the building due to an emergency? If your institution has student housing, campus police and or safety, you need to add a few more components into your annual security report, such as the crime log. Where is the crime log housed? Is it accessible to your community? If you have housing, do you have policies and procedures in place in the event that a student goes missing? Campus sexual assault and prevention response and VAWA, Violence Against Women Act. How often do you have your programs out there for your community throughout this calendar year? Enforcement tools. The Program Participation Agreement, or the PPA, is a contractual contract that each institution signs. It states that the institution understands their obligation and will live up to them, and failure to do so can have a negative result, such as fines up to $57,317 per violation for the Cleary Act. You can have a provisional certification, which then equals to growth restriction. Heightened cash monitoring, limitation, suspension, and or termination. An example of heightened cash monitoring, Michigan State University, they were put on heightened cash monitoring due to the fact of all the serious Cleary violations that they had. Then you'll have the external factors, which are basically a snowball effect. You have student activism, which equals then media attention, which then can turn to public shaming financial exposure. <clears throat> These are some of the program reviews that the department has conducted over the last few years. I encourage you to go to the website on the top of the page, uh, which is the department's data center. There you'll be able to see the different types of violations. And as you can see, we don't discriminate. We go to elite public schools, community colleges, public four-year institution. Um, private school, HBCUs, the department enforces everywhere. An example is University of Jamestown. That was closed in 2017. Their fines were up to $172,000 due to the fact of underreporting forcible offenses and burglary. Annual security report, production, distribution, and notification. Institutions must produce an accurate and complete ASR within one single document. A lot of times we'll go out and we'll conduct program reviews, and sometimes institutions just have one sheet of paper that they turn over to the department and all it has is their crime statistics. Well, then they failed in that area. Institutions must actively distribute a complete annual security report. And with that said, an example is U.S. delivery, snail mail electronic mail, and or hand delivery. And if you do any of those three, how does the institution record it? 
you have to keep the records. You must actively notify prospective students and employees about the availability. If you're a prospective employee, a lot of times institutions have it at the bottom of the um, application, a link so that the prospective employee can click on it and it takes them directly to the annual security report. We want you to know that there are four types of categories of crime. You have your criminal offense, which is the first one, and these are crimes from homicide all the way down to arson. Then you have your hate crimes, a criminal offense that was driven by bias against the victim, such as vandalism or destruction of property. The third one is VAWA, Violence Against Women Act, dating violence, domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. The fourth one is arrest and referrals for disciplinary actions, such as weapons, carrying and possession, drug abuse violation, and liquor law violation. The drug abuse and the liquor law violation, you, get, you pretty much see those primarily when you have student housing. Additional requirements. <clears throat> Institutions must report unfounded crimes, and unfounded crimes can only be unfounded by local law enforcement. Hate crimes, a criminal offense that was driven by bias against the victim. This applies to all clearly reportable offenses. Different categories of the bias are race, religion, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, ethnicity, national origin, and disability. The next few slides are examples of hate crimes. The offender shouted racial slurs to the victim. Bias-related drawings, graffiti left at the crime scene. The offender taped a burning cross. An example, a small institution out in Oregon, a student went into another student's dorm and they lit their Bible on fire. What is a campus security authority? A person who is mandatory reporter under the Cleary Act. Who's a campus security authority? A dean of students, a director of athletics, all athletic coaches, part-time employees, faculty advisors, sexual assault advocates, law enforcement, peer counselors, Title IX coordinators, and this one, where a lot of people get wrong, is coordinator of Greek affairs. An example of this is Michigan State started out with 46, 47 CSAs that they identified. By the time that we go back to do our post-monitoring review, they're going to be in the thousands. Another example is Penn State. Penn State, when we first started the program review, they had 300 CSAs. Now, a couple of months ago, we went out and did a post-review monitoring. They're up to 4,024 CSAs. And these are the different categories for CSAs. What's happening on your campus? Now, these are questions that you should take back to your institution so you can start having these conversations with the administration. How many CSAs does your campus have? How does your school notify CSAs? Do they receive any type of training? And if so, what type of training and is it recorded? Now this is Jean Cleary. A lot of you may have seen this picture before. Back in 1986, she attended Lehigh University. She was awoken by Joseph Henry, who decided to process, in the process of burglarizing the dorm. He then decided to beat, cut, rape, sodomize, and eventually strangle her to death. Prior to Jean's death, there were 181 reports that the dorms had issues of the auto lock. 181, and nothing was done. I never thought this could happen here. It happens anywhere. Crime moves everywhere. After the tragic death of Jean, the Cleary family founded the Security on Campus, otherwise known as the Cleary, Act, the Cleary Center, excuse me. 
and the Cleary Act was signed in 1990. This is Andrew Bolt. Andrew Bolt went to Purdue University. He was an honor roll student studying to be an engineer. His parents sent three children away to school and only two came back. Andrew was shot five times and stabbed 19 times by another student, Cody Cousins. Cody told the judge, I killed Andrew because I wanted to. I'm glad he's dead. Now here's the concern. Cody went to the Counseling and Psychological Service Department at Purdue University 17 times, and nothing was done. As of last Wednesday, the number of shootings has gone up, whether it's K through 12 or higher education. Over 365 mass shootings, and the year's not over yet. There's two types of secure safety alerts. You have your timely warning, which are clearly reportable crimes, and then you have your emergency notification, which are issued for any situation that may pose an immediate threat to health or safety. A good example of emergency notification is Humboldt State University. Uh, if any of you are from California, you know that the uh, gas and electric company has been conducting rollouts. And so the institution went ahead and they sent out an emergency notification to the entire community to let them know that classes would be canceled and this is what they needed to do and when to come back. Then they went out and they sent out another emergency notification just to the housing unit to let them know that where they could go to get extra blankets and flashlights and food. Emergency evacuation and response. You must, this must be included in your ASR. You have to have a clear explanation of methods you use and modify and notify the campus via text, email, or loudspeaker. Description of the process you will use to confirm the presence of the condition, whether it be from law enforcement or the news. You need to determine who needs to receive the information. You need to list in your annual security report the titles of the people who will be carrying out the, modification, the notification process. Example, like the Dean of Student Services or law enforcement. You need to have procedures for testing, and it needs to be done at least once a year. And if it's done, do you, do it, do you announce it, or is it unannounced? Emergency management plan. How do you develop an emergency management plan? You have to have the basic understanding. If you go to the website on the bottom of this screen, it will take you step by step to have a simple modified plan. And it'll take you from beginning all the way to discovery. Other serious threats. You need to evaluate your threats from all risks. And here are some examples here. You might have a disgruntled employee and if you have a disgruntled employee, are they capable of computer sabotage? Do you have internal controls and policies and procedures in place so that that won't happen? So one of the threats that was on the previous page was weather. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things when you have weather-related disasters that are outside the institution's control. So Federal Student Aid has a disaster information page, which you can see up on the screen. Um, it's under Hot Topics, and the inf that is where we are going to post any weather-related, disaster-related um, additional information or news or anything for you guys. The most important resource on that page is Gen 17-08, that Dear Colleague letter. So the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, has different types of designations for disasters based on their severity. They designate by county, so it's really important that you know the county that your institution is in and any additional locations are in. Now, if you come from a rural area, you probably already know what county you're in, but us city folks don't always think in terms of county. So if your county has been designated by FEMA, it's important to know exactly what that designation is. 
So the department has the most flexibility if the designation is for individual assistance. These designations sometimes take days or even weeks to um, come, and sometimes the county will be designated for public assistance to begin with, and then FEMA at some point will switch it to individual assistance. So it is important to keep up with uh, the FEMA's website and figure out exactly what situation you guys are in. So if FEMA says your county is designated for individual assistance, dear colleague letter Gen 17-08, Guidance for helping Title IV participants affected by a major disaster will apply. There's a lot of advice and available waivers in there. Some you can just go ahead and do. Others you need to contact the department, either FSA, your school participation division, or OPE in order to get permission. And some waivers and flexibility count if it's your, only if it's your main campus, some if you have a region, or some even if you only have some students there. For example, if you're in the hills of North Carolina, but you have some students down on the coast that house just got washed away in the latest hurricane, there may be some things in this Dear Colleague letter that you can do to help those students, even though your institution itself is fine. But the students were the ones that were affected. So campus-based funding. If your county is designated for individual assistance, um, both FSCOG and work study money, we may be able to do uh, something for you. It seems like we're having hurricanes every August and September these days. The federal fiscal year ends on October 1st, which means that we need to get all of our money out the door to you by October 1st. The statute allows some flexibility for FSCOG money that it doesn't allow for other um, programs. So if you are one of those institutions that is in the path of a hurricane, you seem to be getting them every year, every other year, I would recommend that you request a little extra money on the campus space reallocation form. Because even if in most years you don't get any extra, that year where your campus is hit, it gives us some more flexibility because we can only give you what you ask for. And of course, you're gonna want more money to help your students. So for work study, we don't have as much flexibility as we do for FSCOG, but we do have some. And recently, Congress has been giving us some additional um, waivers and some additional flexibility to get more money out the door to schools for work study as well. If you do find yourself with some extra money to help your students, some important things to keep in mind is that it First, the first folks you should help, obviously, are the students that were directly affected, and that cleaning up the campus or cleaning up the community after the storm is a legit work-study job. Our goal, like your goal, is to make sure that the students get what they need in order to stay in school. And finally, for the size, it says, contact your school participation division. This is probably the most important piece of information that I will say today which is please contact your school participation division um, if you want a waiver, if you just want to check in and tell us you're okay, for anything really. Um, I remember we had one FAD in Puerto Rico who would call us every single week just to let us know that she was doing okay, tell us the status of their campus, when they thought they'd be able to reopen, check in to see if we had anything to share. And it was, it was really nice that she kept in contact with us. It was also really hard because it meant she had to like travel quite a ways to find cell service in order to touch base with us. But she did it every week. So if she can do it, I know all of y'all can do it. So please get in touch with us and stay in touch. So that's if there's individual assistance. What if there is, um, your county has been designated for public assistance? In this type, you should still contact the department, contact your school participation division. There may still be something that we can do to help. We can authorize some waivers if your county has been designated for public assistance, but all of these need to be done through the school participation division. There isn't anything automatic on those. Also, if there is just a local event, something that FEMA isn't aware of and doesn't rise to that level, you should still contact us and let us know what's going on. Um, there still could be some things that we can do to help. Uh, one example is we had a school that had a pipe burst over uh, winter break, 
and flooded the room where they kept all their, master, their Perkins Master Promissory Notes. And of course they molded and were unusable and unreadable. So they contacted us. We were able to walk them through what to do to document the incident, what happened, what they had lost, and also what alternative documentation they could provide when it came time to assign those loans to the department. And so again, get in touch, stay in touch. And speaking of staying in touch, we strongly encourage you to provide us two emergency contacts um, for your school. If you are either lucky enough to be on vacation when the disaster hits or unlucky enough to be dealing with some sort of family emergency when, when the disaster hits, um, it's really important that we have a second contact. If we don't hear from you after a major disaster for a while, we do reach out just to make sure the school is still operating. And it's really important that we are able to get in touch. Um, and with that, I'm going, and this website lets you know how to do that, how to provide the second emergency contact. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ingrid. Okay, so I'm going to continue the um, weather discussion. Um, and just like Cynthia said, um, when we uh, talk, oops, wrong one, one more. Nope. Other direction. Other direction. Sorry, guys. All right, so record retention. So um, as Cynthia described, there's nothing in our regulations that say that a copy of a record can't and um, should be kept in a safe location. But it's definitely a good practice, and you guys know all about good practices. Because in that scenario where she gave where the pipe burst, which is, a, again, a true scenario, had that you guys stored the, uh, or that school stored the records in a different location, then we wouldn't have had to sort of be in this panic situation trying to um, restore those copies of, of records. And sometimes the records, believe it or not, or there's no duplicate. So it puts you guys in a real difficult situation. So think about storing um, your documents in another location if you can, or in a place where it's waterproof, all right? So I wanna talk a minute about our um, FSA response team. This is a team that was stood up in 2017. And as you can see, there's a list of things that, that this team does. We stood up this team in the department um, primarily because of all the floods, the hurricanes. This is when Hurricane Maria, Harvey, Irma, all of those um, um, disasters hit one after another in the Caribbean and the California wildfires. We had, I think in that particular year, we were dealing with um, disasters from, I would say from July all the way through December. And we were in intense sessions, making sure that you guys were okay, that you had what you need. But we decided after that, that we wanted to stand up this team on a permanent basis. And what we do with that team is we actually monitor sizable weather-related threats. So when a, when a big storm or an event is about to happen, we are on the phone call with FEMA with daily updates. We are on the phone call with um, the K-12 through unit. So we have developed partnerships now with, with these institutions in our, in, um, across the uh, federal agencies. Um, we assist you guys with needs that you have. We have, if you guys have questions, you're feel, uh, feel free to contact us. We also send out two letters to you. And so if you've ever gotten a letter from one of our school participation divisions, we do something called a pre-disaster email where we say, hey school, we know that you're about to go through a disaster and we know that things are going to happen where you probably or may or may not be able to reach us for a while. But we want you to be mindful that we're here for you. We also want you to do some things like Cynthia said, we want you to update your emergency contact informa information. Real important to do that, right? Because if we don't hear from you for a while, we're going to reach out to you to make sure that you're okay. Um, the other thing we do is we send out something called a post-disaster email. It's very similar to that um, email that you got in the first place, but it's one that says, we understand that you're finished with the disaster and there's some things that you may need to reach out and talk to us about. Again, let us know if um, you need anything, we're here to help. It's very important to know that we don't send those emails out to everybody. We try to track the hurricane or the disaster and the path, and we send those emails very targetedly to people in the path. So if you've gotten one of those and you weren't quite in that hurricane at the moment, 
probably because we, we looked at the data at a specific period of time and we thought you would be in that. But one of the things that's real important, as Cynthia said before, is when you get information from us, if we ask you if you were closed, if we ask you if you had any damage, that if you can get back to us, there's usually about four or five questions that we ask you. If you can respond back to us, that information is extremely helpful in getting funds out to you guys the following year. We take that information back to the department and it's analyzed, it's gone, it's used to um, help Congress make allocations to you for the future. So that information is extremely important. The data that you provide in the higher education side for um, disasters is very unique. It's very useful. So again, if you get those letters, um, if you have time, fill it out, give us some information back, and we can tell you what we can do for you the next time around. And so I'm going to turn it back over to Anna. Oh, let me say one more thing. Let me, I'm sorry, real quick. I want, sorry, sorry. So just to give you some statistics of what we've been doing. So since 2017 up until present, we have tracked 22 um, disasters. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it is a lot because these are major disasters, right? Um, we have um, potentially, we've reached out to about 4,000 schools, right? We've sent out um, emails, what we call those pre-disaster emails to about 5,000 schools. We um, sent out post-disaster emails to about 4,200 schools. So we're very active when it comes to this. So if you ever find yourself in one of those disasters, please don't think that we're not here to help you. We are here to help you. And now I will turn it back over to Anna. Omens of things to come. This is the Regents of the University of UCLA versus the Superior Court of Los Angeles. So there was a student in the chemistry lab at UCLA and someone from behind decided to stab her and seriously injure her with a kitchen knife. UCLA allegedly had knowledge of the attacker's schizophrenia and that he basically was hearing voices, that she was calling him names. So the court decided the school's duty is to take reasonable steps to protect students when it becomes aware of a foreseeable safety threat. Laura Dickinson and Jean Cleary. Now Laura Dickinson died some 20 years after Jean Cleary did, almost exactly the same at Eastern Michigan University. The only difference is the university tried to cover it up. The university tried to say that she died of an accident by an asthma attack. The responding officer said, I'm not changing the report. The chief of police said, you need to change the report. She said, no, I'm not. The president said, you need to change the report. She said, no. Eventually, everyone was let go, including the president, and the officer still works there to this day. She did the right thing. Campus sexual assault. This happens at any institution. The first case that the Department of Education had was around 15 years ago at a small career college where four sexual assaults took place and no one reported them. VAWA Against Women Act reauthorization um, of 2013. VAWA Act fills the space between the Cleary Act and Title IX. The act emphasizes on awareness and training, more effective measures of inv to investigate. This law is about giving people choices on how to report. Primary prevention are the long-term steps you need to take at your institution to re reduce sexual assaults over time. Risk reduction, what can you at your institution do to immediately reduce the likelihood of these crimes to happen at your institution? Bystander intervention. Get the community involved so this doesn't happen. What does a predator look like? Predator can be the person sitting next to you on the train on your way into the office. Or it can be your neighbor. It could be the person standing in front of you at the grocery store. What you don't want is you don't want a Jerry Sandusky. You don't want a Steven Jensen. 
Stephen Jensen, if, I'm not sure if many of you know who he is, he was a doctor at the University of Michigan Hospital. He was addicted to child pornography and he used to bring it into the office. A Larry Nasser. What can you do to protect your institution? You need to be proactive, encourage prompt reporting, foster a culture of transparency, make it easy for everyone to report, and keep everybody informed. You want to share your best practices. You want to network with different institutions to talk about what they're doing, and maybe it might work for you. The key is administrative capability. You need to hire an adequate number of qualified personnel. You need to have checks and balances for your internal controls. You need to implement written procedures and also apply them. A lot of times you have procedures and you just need to apply them. <clears throat> you need to have detailed, it has to have substance, comprehensive, reliable, and consistent. Thank you. If anyone has any questions, we'll open up the floor now. I work at a family-owned school, so my question is, is when we're setting up emergency contacts, should they be related to each other or not? Um, it's probably best that they not be, but there isn't really any rules regarding who your emergency contacts are, could be. We just ask for two because we know there have been situations where one isn't, we're unable to get in contact with the one. And okay. one more thing on this, you guys might have seen that I started to tear up when I talk about this issue. And I would encourage you all to have the emergency contact stuff for your personal lives as well as your... Um, as well as professionally for the school. Um, when Jeff Appel first went into the hospital, we weren't contacted for several days because his family didn't know how to get in touch with anybody at the department, and they finally figured out how to contact me. And um, if you, <laughs> sorry. Um, but I'd highly encourage you to to talk to your families as well and have emergency contacts set up so if somebody at work knows how to get a hold of your spouse, if somebody at home knows how to get a hold of your, your boss or one of your coworkers or something as well, um, as well as two people from your school that we can get in contact with. Thank you. Um, sorry for your loss, just to start off with that. Thank you. Um, in light of all of the things that have been going on um, at schools, colleges, elementary schools all over, are there any revisions to Cleary that are upcoming that you know of that you can share, or any improvements or anything like that? There aren't any. Uh, although Congress is looking at redoing the Higher Education Act, I haven't heard of any changes specifically to Cleary. Hi. Um, in regards to like the emergency drills, not the ones that are like done in like the residence halls or anything like that. Um, two part. Number one is you had mentioned they need to be like annual, like at least annually. Um, how do you deal with somebody that's? I've been doing this for a decade. I know everything about anything and everything to do with Cleary and the root. That whole thing. Um, <laughs> uh, where can I direct them to say no? And here's where it says you have to do these annually. So get on it. I'll let you take that one. Okay. So it's in the federal regulations, and it's also in the campus safety handbook as well, the 2016 edition. 26. Okay. And yeah, and you can Google that. I believe off of IFAP. I believe it's on there. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, and then also with that emergency, like you had also mentioned the crime reporting and stuff. Mm -hmm. I was at a training and it said if you had multiple locations, like you needed to report the data based on each of those locations. Um, we don't have an official like separate campus, mm -hmm. um, but we do rent a building that is off our main campus. 
Um, and so I'm assuming that would constitute an additional, I had to do the PPA for an additional location. <laughs> so in my mind, it is an additional location if I had to do the Correct. work. Yes. So I would assume then that data would also need to be surrounded around that location and included in our report. Correct. Correct. And they need to be distinguished between main campus versus that location. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Great question. Thank you. Hi. You had, uh, one of the lawsuits you had up there was uh, with California just a few moments ago where the student was in a lab uh, and was stabbed from behind. The university allegedly knew that the person had mental illness. Uh, and I, I guess my, what stuck to me, and maybe I misheard, was that the, the, the lawsuit was because the, the institution didn't say anything to anyone about this alleged mental illness. And I didn't know if there would be concerns with you know, us thinking that a student might have something undocumented, uh, et cetera, and running into a FERPA violation, I guess, is really where I'm going. Uh, and, and really what burden is on the institution to say something uh, if they don't really know? Because it, it seemed to me like in the example you provided that the university really didn't know for sure that the student had a, a documented illness. You know, that's an excellent question, and we're going to have to take it back on how FERPA and, and their duty to warn interplay. Okay, great. Thanks. Do you have a best practice for who the Title IX coordinator should report to? Because our Title IX coordinator reports to the chief of police. And it, it's, uh, it, it makes sense in some ways, but it doesn't make sense to me in other ways. Um, do, is there a best practice for who Title IX should, a coordinator should report to? The, the reason I asked also because you noticed that the chief of police up there said that they need to quash that police report. And so I feel like there's not a conflict there, but there's an inherent, um, there's a bit of a conflict sometimes. If, if the chief of police decides, <laughs> you know what, we're not reporting this. And by the way, if you do, you're fired. I mean, no one dealt, that dealt with the police officer, but... We don't have anything documented on that. Okay, gotcha, thank you. I actually had a question in regards, because you, FERPA was brought up, but it's not only a FERPA issue, there's also a HIPAA issue if you have a family counselor that counsels students. And I noticed on one of the slides, you said that pastoral counselors are exempt from this. And so uh, my concern is if you have a pastoral counselor at a school and they're exempt, but yet they kind of work for the school, and yet a counselor that it works for the school that's non-pastoral, he has uh, uh, an obligation to keep you know, the information that he's given by a student confidential via HIPAA. So, how do you handle something where that, you know, that counselor gets in trouble, but the pastoral counselor doesn't? It's not, it doesn't seem fair to me in that, in that aspect, if you're talking about the Clery Act. So I don't know which slide to flip back to, but it wasn't just pastoral counselors. There's other counselors that also are exempt. Um, but it's not... Everybody. It's pretty narrowly drawn as to who would be exempt. Right, but if the counselor works for the school, you would say that person falls under the Clery Act because they're paid by the school. Because everybody that is, uh, basically what you're saying is everybody that is either uh, administrative or anything like that would fall under that category. Because you, you brought up a, an institution that thought they had 300 that were part of it, but it turns out that every single staff member is part of it. So that counselor would also fall under that category as staff. So there's some very specific exemptions that are worked out for specific types of counselors. Pastoral counselor is one. Um, there's another one, and maybe I can flip through and find the right slide on here. 
And there's more information in the Cleary handbook. Is that the right document? There's more information in Cleary about which specific people at your school are exempt, and then the others are not. Okay. And so it's the fact that they work for the school isn't really an issue, but they have to meet the other criteria to have that exemption. Okay, so uh, that's what is going to be the saving grace on certain people, right? For certain people. Okay. And it's pretty narrowly drawn. So I would encourage you to look at the uh, Cleary Handbook and see exactly what those requirements are. Okay, thank you. Do you have a best practice? If we have a student who has done a health withdrawal for um, mental illness, but the student wants to return, and we knew when the student did the withdrawal that they were a danger either to themselves or to others, when the student wants to come back, is there anything that you can do to be sure that student is ready to come back? Do we have any advice or anything for them on that? Unfortunately, we don't have any documented advice on that topic either. So just, I guess because the reason I'm asking is in, in this, the lawsuit about um, everybody knowing the student had schizophrenia. So we've had a case of a student, but that student did do an admin a health withdrawal. The student didn't come back and then reapplied for admission, but we couldn't really stop that student because we can't ask for that documentation, right? We'll have to take that back. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. Hi, Cindy. I, too, am sorry for your loss and everyone. Thank you. Um, I, I don't want to add to the conversation. I just want to sort of stop that conversation that we sort of been having. Um, there's been conversations about red flag laws, and we've heard about so many things that we should have known and been able to stop. I think as financial aid administrators, we do a great job of making professional judgments. Uh, unfortunately, not everyone is as good as financial aid administrators. So uh, I think, and, and you were kind enough to say, we'll get back to you, but there is no guidance on these kind of things. Uh, so we just do our best to do our best and, and, and you know, know the regulations and what is written, but still it's a very fine line that we are touching upon in this conversation. So I, I just don't really want to Abs talk about absolutely. it Absolutely, these are not easy issues, and we recognize that, and we don't have all the answers. Anyone else? Good afternoon. I have a question in regards to, we're a small campus, um, everybody comes there, no one sleeps there, so it's not. Um, what is an adequate number of qualified persons? You said that at one point there should be a lot more. Was one enough, two enough, 15? With a with, uh, population of 300 students? It all depends on your type of institution, the size. You have to see what kind of issues you have. Um, it's really a judgment call on administration side to see how many staff you're going to have, unfortunately. Okay, I just want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And if I have an ASR report that you're asking for, I don't want to be fined for things that, you know, potentially should have done better. Mm -hmm. So if the fact is that I have to train another five individuals, then so be it. But I want to make sure that I post everything accurately, not only on their website, but give it to our students. Sure. That's a great question. And you know, we're here to, to review your annual security report if you want. Um, you can email it to me or you can give it to me today and I can take it back with me and I can review it and I can give you a call. And just to let you know, anything... We're here to help you. So it's not that, oh, you gave me something, so now we're going to go and conduct a program review. That's not how we work. So I just kind of want to let you know that. And I'll be at the Resource Center as well for the rest of the week, too, in case you want to stop by and have more conversation. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Would you please elaborate more on the, the, camp the survey? and the ASR, I guess my question is sort of following up on hers. 
Um, you mentioned earlier that the, the results of the survey, there are institutions that put out a one-pager and say that's the, their ASR. Mm -hmm. Um, and then following up on that is, is there a template or a model, a ASR, that you can recommend that institutions refer when they provide or prepare their own? Okay. So in the Campus Safety Handbook, there's step-by-step -step on how you can produce your annual security report, how you can produce your statistics. What I meant as far as the one-pager is you do your survey and you submit it to the department. So once you submit it to the department, those statistic numbers have to match with what you have in your annual security report. And so a lot of times what happens is, say, under um, robbery, you might submit something to the department and it said three for on-campus robbery. And then when I look at your annual security report that you publish and you have on your website, it says four. And it could just be a typo because there's so many categories that you're going down and you're putting a number that it, you know, it just might be an error. Does that make sense to answer your question? Yes, and you will be available at the Resource Center. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, we're an institution that sends students to clinical um, internships that range anywhere from like 100 to 1,000 hours. Um, in safety handbook, if I understood it correctly, it says that the incidents of clearly reporting crimes that happen at the internship sites are not to be included in statistics. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, what if the incident invol involves, uh, let's say, an instructor that also works for our college, but it did happen at the site? No, because you don't control and own that property. Okay, so even if everyone involved kind of belongs to our institution, mm -hmm. as long as it happened off-site, we don't have to report. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Again, I'll be at the Resource Center if you have any more questions or if you want me to take a look at your annual security report.